Welcome to Designing a Way Forward Post-COVID in Ambulatory Care Environments, a webinar brought to you by Medical Construction and Design Magazine and sponsored by Midmark Corporation. If you look below the event window under Handouts, you will find a link to PDF of the brochure Design for the Point of Care, which you are welcome to download. At any time, you can type questions into the text box on your screen and then press Enter. At the conclusion of the presentation, questions will be read aloud, and we will try to get to as many as possible. If your question is not answered, we will try to respond to you after the webinar. Our speakers today are Kurt Forstoffel and Tracy Timmerman from the Midmark Corporation. Kurt Forstoffel is the Downstream Marketing Director of the Medical Division at Midmark. Forstoffel supports the Midmark commitment to supply healthcare providers with solutions that enable effective and efficient patient care through seamless room design, better equipment, smarter workflows, and integrated technologies. Tracy Timmerman is a marketing manager in the medical division at Midmark. Timmerman is responsible for driving product marketing strategies, product launches, and programs supporting the exam chair, procedure chair, and the lighting product categories. And now, please welcome Tracy. Yeah, thanks so much, Nikki. Thanks for having us today. And thanks to everyone who called in and um, gave some time to their day to spend with Kurt and I as we talk about designing a way forward post-COVID in the ambulatory care environment. So obviously, we're still very much in that pandem pandemic state with all the different variants coming out. Um, but throughout the pandemic, uh, certain design elements have really come to the forefront and will continue to be important elements um, now and moving into the future. Things such as infection prevention, your instrument processing procedures, and reducing cross-contamination um, of patients in the facilities. So these are definitely elements throughout the design that we want to keep a focus on um, and, and will be considered um, in that design design layout. So today we'll really be looking at everything from the layout of the facility itself, uh, the layout and configuration of the exam room, and different patient workflows throughout that facility, as well as equipment and technology within that space. So we have a lot of good topics um, to cover today. But before we really go any deeper, uh, we'll just, we have some learning objectives to kind of set the stage. So at the end of today's webinar, you'll gain a better understanding of how the layout and configuration of the room and equipment impacts the effectiveness of the clinical space. So we'll kind of start by looking at a high-level facility design, and then we'll dive deeper into the exam room design itself. You also learn which patient-centered workflow design models provide a better experience for both the patient and the provider. So we'll introduce and we'll review various workflows, uh, whether that be the self-rooming, uh, where the waiting room is eliminated, or a continuous care model. So all of which add versatility to that room, which is so needed right now. So some of you may have heard of these uh, workflows and others may be new. So we'll walk through those. And then finally, you'll start to realize how equipment and technology specifically designed for clinical environments can really complement operational objectives. We know operational objectives are, are key as there are more and more patients and fewer providers. They're being asked to do more with less. So we definitely want to make sure that we're gaining those operational efficiencies in our workflows. And then with that holistic approach that looks at the facility, that patient workflow throughout the facility and equipment design, uh, you will see increased efficiencies that support operational objectives. So those are our objectives of the webinar. And that brings us to our first poll question, which Nikki is going to guide us through. Okay, so the first question is, how much knowledge do you already have regarding facility and exam room design? The choices are high, medium, and low. All right, Nikki, and I'm seeing those answers come in. A lot of people responding, so appreciate that. 
looks like it's starting to slow down. And it looks like the majority are about medium, so about half medium, um, about 7% low, and about 40% high. So great, uh, good uh, versatile group, hopefully. Um, and really, that just helps Bert and I kind of give us a baseline of where we're at um, today. Good thing not everybody's high, or I just asked somebody to, to do this presentation for me. But um, hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll be able to say that you went from either a low to a medium or a medium to a high. So appreciate you all taking the time to do that. All right, so no doubt um, one, chain, one, one constant is always change. We all know that uh, things are always changing and adjusting in the healthcare space. And this has certainly been felt throughout the pandemic as well as, guide, as guidelines are continuously monitored and, and adjusted as data is collected um, and new learnings are gained. So that will continue. And at Midmark, we're always striving to look years ahead at the new technologies and innovations that are coming out, the different trends in the market um, to be sure that we're staying on top of those advancements. And we really work to learn and adjust as that market changes and our customer needs change. So at Midmark, we are the only clinical environmental design company that enables a better care experience at that point of care, right at the right where care takes place in the exam room. And this is done through the harmonization of space, the technology within that space, products and workflows for caregivers and patients. So at Midmark, we were really focused on improving that experience between the patient and the caregiver. And we designed that clinical ecosystem on which many physicians practice medicine. So this is gonna include everything from your exam table, you have lights, the seating and stools, cabinetry, and the diagnostic devices. And what we do is we, we really bring all of this equipment together through a coordinated workflow with a focus on many critical elements such as patient and staff safety, we want good working ergonomics, and enabling good clinical outcomes. And we're committed to, committed to providing those new solutions through design improved workflows and technology that help our healthcare customers deliver better and safer environments. So all of these things have always been important and only heightened awareness through, through the pandemic. All right, and now I'm going to hand it over to Kurt, and he's gonna walk us through some patient-centered workflow design models. Thank you, Tracy. So to start with, there are a lot of forces in healthcare that are driving change in the industry. You know, for a while there, it seemed to be at glacial speed, but over the last 10 years, even pre-COVID, there's been a lot of shift happening in the marketplace, and that's including things from shifting from fee-for-service to value-based payments, uh, decentralization of primary care from maybe large acute centers to more localized uh, residential settings, uh, more of a drive to connectivity and sharing of information, which is becoming increasingly critical in the care of patients. But there's also things like consumerism or price print transparency that's uh, evolving in healthcare. And there's a lot of consolidation in care providers and payers. So health systems are really looking for ways to design and standardize their workflows to take some of this pressure from these, these various macro level trends, if you will, um, moving forward so they can deliver the best care possible. To do this, they really need to rethink their entire patient experience and patient-centered workflow designs, and that's a, that's a phrase you'll hear throughout this presentation. There are a number of workflows that we'll take a look at today that can add value for the patient while increasing the uh, efficiencies at the same time. Whether it's a self-rooming model or even a dual-access model, the key to it is that the patient is at the center of the care. So design has evolved as a strategic component of the point of care ecosystem that, that we, we speak about. Speak about. Um, patient volumes are rising, yet the demand for efficient quality care remains rather constant. Therefore, the design that helps optimize your workflows improve processes to provide the best patient and caregiver experience is really critical. Uh, 
attention to this design has never been ever more important that to healthcare systems and practices as they look for approaches that bring together people, processes, and technology to support increased efficiency, safety, as well as improved outcomes. This is really summed up in the quadruple aim, which speaks to patient care experience, improved outcomes, lower cost, and improved care team well-being. So when you look at it from a holistic perspective, it's really the foundation of the healthcare, enhanced healthcare experience. Health systems are learning that many hidden costs in the non-standardized processes as well as equipment, and oftentimes will, systems will just simply tolerate the variability. Uh, this variability is often exposed as it facilities become consolidated when hospital networks are bought out by larger hospital networks. So they try to consolidate their services. They may have different ways of delivering care, different processes, and even different standards. They may even have, and most likely will have, different equipment and technology. All of this variation just leads to waste in their system. They might be wasting time as they're searching for equipment, or wasting time just trying to figure out how to use one device in the facility they were in today versus what they had to use yesterday when they might be working in a different facility. So spending that time figuring out how to use a device just isn't an efficient use of their time. It's, it's estimated by 2029, which used to sound a long ways out, but now it just seems like it's just a few years away. Outpatient visits nationally are going to total, are going to, uh, total roughly 2.7 billion visits, which is more than all customer engagements throughout the balance of the continuum of care combined. So taking a holistic design approach is really a must to enhance healthcare experiences, improve those clinical outcomes, and increase efficiencies and driving costs down as well. So taking a holistic design approach really looks at three main components, and that's really the overall facility design, workflow design, and the design within the exam room. We'll take a look at each of these now. So when we speak of the facility design, we're really talking about design needs to add more value in the, in the, in the clinical space. So new designs need to be developed simultaneously improve patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, and staff engagement. By doing this, they'll reduce costs and, and, and waste. This is, again, referencing back to the triple aim, or quadruple aim, excuse me. This starts with the facility design and considers what may need to change. At first, you'll want to think about patient flow overall through the facility and then take a, a layer deep look at the flow within the exam room itself. And when we think the patient flow, there are some different models around the exam space that you can look at. First question is, how will a patient even get to the room? And there are just different workflows you can use to, con to, to, to shape this. Um, uh, one is called the dual access model. Sometimes it's referred to as offstage, onstage, or even the Disney model. This really turns the layout of the facility inside out or on its side. It's really a different, complete layout of the floor plan. Rather than having hallways on, on which both sides of the hallway you're going to have exam rooms, this really puts the providers and housekeeping and all the staff of the facility in the center, and they have exam rooms around the perimeter of that facility. In such a design, there are two entry points to the exam room. The patient will enter on one side on this, from a separate hall, and the staff or technicians or care team are on the inside of the facility of the overall design, and they're going to enter from the different side. As you look at this picture, where you have dual access models, that's where the physician or care team would come through that door and the and the door closest to you is where the patient would come through. The idea behind this is to help minimize conflicts and workflow and minimize contact, particularly as we're going through this COVID crisis. It allows the patient to 
come down one separate hallway that's designed specifically exclusively for patients and then the care team accesses from a separate side so whether it's the medical assistant nurse physician or even housekeeping who's coming in to clean the room or reset the room they'll access the room from a different side and this, the use of these two different doors includes the room design and workflow by providing separate flow paths. And it eliminates all those obstacles so patients don't have to run into somebody who might be taking dirty trash or trash or, or dirty linens out of the facility or even coming come in contact with other providers. It really does minimize the potential for cross-contamination. Another model option is takes a different approach. And it's, it's almost a, an option within an exam room design. And this is the idea behind this, is to make all exam rooms more flexible and functional. This means going, ongoing monitoring for patients in addition, addition to scheduled office visits. The idea behind this provides a designated consulting zone or even could be used as a telehealth zone that gives physicians the ability to stay in contact with caregivers and to monitor the patient's health most closely. Remote diagnostic tools can provide a means of feedback and ongoing monitoring, supporting the continuous patient care relationship. So that space in the room there can be used either as a consult zone or, like I said, a continuous care zone where you're reaching out through virtual engagement with the patient. And then the self-rooming model is a variation on all of these, these themes. Throughout the pandemic, there's been a lot of interest in eliminating the waiting room. Um, this is a concept that's been, a, been around for a few years, and it's been adopted in a number of facilities across the nation as a way to improve efficiency and, and remove bottlenecks. And now with COVID, it's also about eliminating cross-contamination between patients. Nobody wants to go to their doctor and leave less healthy than when they arrived. So self room not only eliminates the waiting room, which may save some space and, and real estate costs, but it also helps eliminate waste in that the staff doesn't have to spend time moving the patient. And it also helps reduce the risk of cross-contamination. So some of the win-wins of this um, of the self-rooming model. And then when we look at workflow design, this is looking a little bit different. The focus is really patient-centered design, which limits the unnecessary patient interactions and movement throughout the facility. Everything related to the patient is brought to the patient. The idea is that once a patient gets into an exam room, they no longer have to move throughout the facility. This saves time and increases efficiency by minimizing the amount of conveyance on behalf of the patient. It also reduces, again, another opportunity for cross-contamination as that patient has less interactions with other patients, staff, and even facilities within the room. And also in this design, it establishes two distinct zones in the room. Instead of having uh, less consideration about equipment layout, we have, you can come up with designs that doesn't necessarily dictate a higher equipment cost, but just rather how that equipment is laid out in the exam space. It allows the, what we call the uh, dedicated zone to the private zone shown here in blue, where the physician and pa patient engagement happens, is clearly separated by the public zone where guests might come in, whether it's a family member who might be visiting with the patient. So clearly, separates those two zones so that the physician or the caregiver can provide care to the patient in the most effective way without having to cross into the public zone. And it also positions supply and IT resources within easy reach. Brings us to poll question number two. Nikki? All right, question two is, how much time do you think is saved per patient when bringing all vital signs acquisition to the point of care, including weight, and using an automated device? 
more than a minute, less than a minute, not enough to be impactful are your choices. The answers are coming in. Okay. I think that's about it. Uh, the, the best answer is more than a minute, and roughly 87% of the attendees got that one right. We actually did a time study uh, conducted where we went to 12 non-acute care facilities and did a time study with 667 patients across three different methods of vital signs acquisition when we were looking at traditional triage or uh, weight in the hallway and then some other vitals in the exam room. If you can locate all of those vitals into the exam space but and make it patient-centered care so the patient just goes to the room and they can get their weight taken say by uh, an exam table with the building scale connected to the vitals device they can actually save more than a minute on on each patient and that just frees up the medical assistant or nurse to do more work that they they need to do throughout their day this doesn't include anything like blood draws but there may be additional conveyance required for, for situations like that. But the best solution here is to try to drive all cares, all, all points of care, including phlebotomy, into the exam space if at all possible. All right. On to equipment and technology. Um, equipment that's designed to help increase patient accessibility and safety for patients and caregiver is, is very critical. It allows the, the patient to easily access the exam chairs, it allows the providers not to have to physis, position patients um, on, on the table so they don't have to do any kind of lifting for the patient. And then from a technology perspective, if, we, if it gets integrated in the EMR, like we just mentioned through the survey, you can save more than a minute per patient by bringing all the vitals acquisitions to the point of care, which includes things like weight and also using an automated vital signs device. You can also reduce transcriptions, manual transcription errors, by up to 17% if you can connect your vitals device to your EMR and you can post all of that data you've captured, whether it's temperature, um, pulse rate, SpO2, and weight, um, into that EMR from the vital signs device. So now benefits of a holistic design. Stacey? All right. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks so much for walking us through those those workflows. Um, so so there's obviously there's many workflows to consider and benefits to each. So when taking a holistic design approach to the facility design, that patient flow, that workflow, um, you know, everything from, from the minute the patient walks into the door, um, through a waiting room or a hallway, exam room, we really want to consider that entire experience um, whenever doing that, whenever considering design. And then, of course, also equipment and technology uh, design in that space as well. All of this will lead to several benefits, which we will go through here. So on the screen here are these four bullets. These are the key benefits that we're really going to hone in on. So. As healthcare systems rethink design and workflow and they begin to standardize the design, the healthcare experience will be enhanced for both the patient and the caregiver. So when considering the patient, there's certainly less conveyance. 
we can, you know, if we do the self-rooming, which Kurt touched on, uh, and vo avoiding the, the waiting room, um, and we bring everything to, if everything's done in the exam room, uh, we may not need to bring patients um, to, to a different triage nook, for example. Everything can be done in one place. So great experience for the patient. And we also can keep everything at that point of care. Um, just like it's shown on the screen here, you can see on that screen, everything at that point of care is nice and tight. Um, the patient and the caregiver are able to face each other. Uh, there's a workstation that keeps the technology available but not disruptive. So really in increases that experience and interaction between the patient and the caregiver. Uh, there'll also be operational benefits will be realized. Um, again, so, so important with having to do more with less. Uh, and then there's also increased capability to expand care everywhere. Definitely uh, true and needed during the pandemic. Um, I know myself, I had to use uh, telehealth a couple times over the last 18 months, and it, it was a great experience, and I appreciated that technology and that um, that option. So uh, definitely the need to expand that care everywhere beyond the traditional model. And then all of this will ultimately, ultimately lead to improved clinical outcomes as we standardize on our equipment and we standardize on our processes, uh, we'll start to see those improved clinical outcomes. So those are the four benefits that we will go into a little more detail on the upcoming slide. So first is that enhanced healthcare experience. So workflow designs will enhance that experience in a variety of ways. So when you think about that, uh, a patient-centered workflow, the, the, the patient is brought right to the exam room. Uh, there's no stops along the way. So again, self-rooming is a great way to reduce that wait time and also reducing that risk of cross-contamination for the patients. Um, and then everything happens right in that space. So, and then once the patient is there in the exam room, they're directed to an exam chair uh, that can support proper uh, posture and positioning for blood pressure measurements. So ideally that exam chair allows the patient to have their feet flat on the floor, their back can be supported, and their arm is able to be at heart height. So all of those guidelines for a, prop, a proper BP. And then the exam chair, if it also has an integrated scale, you can take weight along with all of those other vitals with an automated vital signs device. You can capture uh, the patient's temperature, their pulse, uh, the oxygen saturation and blood pressure. All that's captured right in the exam room with the patient on the chair. Um, and then all of that vitals data can then be imported directly into that EMR, saving time and eliminating transcription errors. So, we said we know that those transcription errors are about 17 percent when um, so we can reduce those errors certainly if we do that in an automated fashion so um, this also is going to create a safer environment like we talked about just reducing that conveyance so think of the wheelchair patient or a wheelchair you know a walker um, or just any kind of mobility challenges we want to reduce that conveyance it's going to be safer it's going to tame stock safe save time but, and efficiency, but it's going to be the best experience for that patient. Um, and we'll also reduce that risk of contagious pathogens, reducing that cross-contamination that is so important right now. And then, of course, all of this can be done while maintaining that important patient-provider interaction as technology is seamlessly designed. So technology can certainly support the experience without it being disruptive. All right, and that's going to take us to poll question number three. Nikki, will you guide us through this one? Yes, it is. What do you think is the typical exam room utilization? 54%, 33%, or 17% are your options. All right, more and more answers are coming in. You all are wonderful audience. Appreciate you taking the time to put your answers in. Looks like we have a majority of them. 
So the correct answer is actually 33%. So 67% of the audience got that one right. Um, and 29% guessed 54%. And uh, we had a few people say 17%. So yes, the correct answer is 33%. Uh, which is it is really staggeringly low when you think about it in terms of hours in a day It means two out of three hours. The room is not being utilized and there's a lot of Equipment in that room that's not being utilized then you think of all of the technology uh, the workstations with computers um, Even the exam chair all of that is not being used two out of three hours of the day, which is concerning so when you think about how can we streamline the workflow to increase utilization. So there's things such as your workflow that can increase the patient throughput. Um, so that will provide a better experience for the patient, getting more patients through. But we also need to think about our physicians. They have a lot going on in a day, um, a lot of requirements. They're just very busy. So how can we uh, keep, the, you know, how can we help our physicians? So again, we want to keep everything right at the point of care for them, all within fingertips, whether it be equipment or data. Um, and one of the things we can also do is um, asset tracking, making sure that they don't have to look for equipment. And we do that through um, real-time locating our, our RTLS technology. So just a few things to consider on how to get that utilization rate up just a bit. All right, and the next benefit that we'll cover is the increased operational efficiencies. So when you, you take that holistic approach to design, it will certainly increase the operational efficiencies. When you think of a connected ecosystem, again, everything is done in that exam room. So with EMR connectivity, data is readily available to help make informed decisions every step of the patient visit. So we already talked a lot about how helping physicians and making sure everything's in arm's reach. And of course, that's going to include data as well. So with that connected ecosystem, they can have reports, um, they can pull those up, and they can evaluate that all with that connected ecosystem. We'll also gain greater visibility to existing workflows and processes. Um, and that's made available with real-time locating system or that RTLS technology I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. And this will expose opportunities for improvement. So what RTLS is going to do is it really gives kind of a bird's eye view of, of colleagues, where patients are, or where equipment may be located um, within your practice in real time. So if you look on the screen here, that kind of shows what that bird's eye view looks like. So you'll be able to tell um, you know, who may be waiting, uh, or where where different colleagues or or equipment is. So that's kind of how that that system is set up and will work. It's just a really nice visual uh, system. And this is done when using badges that are worn by by people or tags that are affixed to to equipment that likes to walk off sometimes, like those workstations. Sometimes those are hard to track down. So uh, we can put a tag on there. We'll know right where it is. And there are sensors that are placed in the ceiling throughout the facility. And then that sophisticated software, RTLS will gather uh, all of that location data and it turns it into really actionable insights to improve workflow. So it's going to give insights to maybe where bottlenecks may be, uh, or, and it really may give you a starting point to understand where to start standardizing or building in improvements into the facility. So some really nice data can be gathered by that. RTLS technology. All right, and then the final benefit that we will cover is expanded care everywhere. So technology is continuing to advance and, and that will it will always advance. And with the shift to create more accessible patient-centered experience, it's driving the need to expand that point of care outside of just the traditional model. And COVID has really proved uh, that telehealth is needed and the pandemic only accelerated those virtual visits. So it's becoming um, a viable and, and long lasting option. And so equipment, we'll need equipment that can support those virtual visits such as the, the workstations that are shown on the screen here. Um, that really brings a lot of flexibility within that exam space and can be used uh, for telehealth visits as well. 
And then of course your rooms should be designed to be very versatile so that you can support uh, consultations, in-person exams, but also telehealth or virtual visits. So we want to build that versatility in because um, it's certainly been needed throughout this the last 18 months for sure. All right, and now I'm gonna hand it back over to Kurt uh, covering improved clinical outcomes. Thank you, Tracy. Um, finally, we, we want to talk about improved clinical outcomes and how they provide another benefit of a holistic design approach. Uh, one of the keys of that is making sure that technology, don't let technology be disruptive in the room. Um, integrating the technology seamlessly helps quite a bit and it, it humanizes the aspects of care uh, last thing we want to do is is design a, a exam room or medical facility where the information technology isn't compensated for in the design and it, it and therefore it gets somewhat shoehorned in to the design and at, at times it may may put the physicians using the technology back to the patient and that's that's a really an engagement no no um, so making sure the proper workflows are in, in place to help improve clinical outcomes, such as BP measurement, um, patient and staff safety that we mentioned before, infection prevention that we've been mentioning throughout this in the, in the new COVID world we live in, and then instrument processing. So let's, let's walk through each one of these and, and get a little bit more detail. Blood pressure measurement is, is what our chief medical officer likes to call it is like looking into the, the looking through the eyes and soul of a patient's overall health. Um, it's captured in nearly every patient encounter. It's, it's one of the most important factors in point of care diagnosis. Um, it helps in patient risk stratification and medication dosing. But slight variations, even very slight, you know, five millimeters of mercury variations and measurement based on technique can have a big impact on efficiency, the accuracy, and even the patient outcomes. The American Heart Association recommends that during the BP captured, there should be no talking to the patient. The patient should be seated comfortably with their back supported. Uh, their arms should be supported uh, with a cuff at heart height. Their legs should be uncrossed and their feet flat on the floor, and the cuff should be placed on a bare arm. Unfortunately, these guidelines aren't often followed, and about two out of two to three patients uh, out of four, um, or 65 to 75% of the time, it, it's not followed. This leads to about 16% of Americans at risk for errors in BP measurement of at least or more than five millimeters of mercury, leaving them vulnerable to the effects of a misdiagnosis. And this could lead to increased risk of stroke or heart attack, or for that matter, they could have a mis, um, mis -prescribed prescription of drug and lead into a drug reaction. Three million Americans could be affected by overestimating the true blood pressure by just as little as five millimeters five millimeters of mercury, uh, leading to inappropriate treatment and unnecessary cost. The annual cost of, to treat high blood pressure in the U.S. is $46 billion. Standardizing the blood pressure workflow can help avoid much of this cost. Next, we can speak to patient and staff safety. Since the creation of the American with Disabilities Act, or ADA, Accessibility has become a legal requirement, but even more important than the legal aspect of it is making an accessible design uh, by providing better care to all patients, regardless of the type of disability uh, or other limitations. However, the federal American with Disabilities Act guidelines could be over, um, could be trumped, if you will, by state regulations concerning relationships in the clinical exam space. As these lines become a little bit more blurred, it, it can be confusing for health systems to 
really understand how to best provide accessibility to equal care. So some key factors to consider when, when looking at the exam room layout is the overall size of the room, or what types of procedures are you going to conduct in that space, the type of equipment used in the room, and what floor space it might be required, the state in which you're building this facility as state codes, again, may be more restrictive than federal codes. The type of mobility devices you expect to see being used by patients, whether it's a walker, a wheelchair, or a scooter. And the benefits of this could lead to increasing patient throughput. And the, one of the most important benefits of late has been around preventing burnout and staff turnover because if, if the exam room is not designed to compensate for the ADA requirements, that requires them to do more work to help patients get positioned, that takes time, that puts the patient at risk of fall, and that puts the staff at risk of musculoskeletal industry or injury. So locating equipment um, for care and maintenance is also one of the last factors to consider. And then the hottest topic of the last year has been around infection prevention. Um, when you design a room, try to take into account now that we have COVID in our lives, you know, how to design for infection prevention. So patients can bypass the waiting room with self-rooming workflows, which we talked about earlier about how they can allow them to self room and not have to wait in a waiting room can allow patients to proceed immediately to the design assigned room and avoids one of the most likely locations for exposure to cont contagions. With technology such as RTLS, you have the ability for automated contact tracing. If someone enters your clinic who, who has or is later diagnosed with an infectious disease, the RTLS data can quickly identify who that person was and who they came in contact with, for how long, with what equipment. And that really takes out the guesswork for, and, and speeding up an otherwise labor and time intensive contact tracing process if you had to do it manually. We also talked about things such as dual access workflow, where you have set for flow paths for the patient and the care team. This is another easy way to compensate uh, for minimizing infection prevention and cross-contamination. Another laborious process that we have to deal with in our clinics is instrument processing. This is a critical part of any infection prevention, prevention protocol you might have in your facility. And even with a designated area for instrument processing, there's a chance a workflow may not be designed or organized as efficiently as it could. Ideally, the instrument processing space should be a separate and distinct area designed specifically for instrument processing and sterilization. This separate space allows easier control and management of the process and helps ensure safety and, and a more efficient workflow as well. An instrument processing area should not be shared space as we typically see with a laboratory staff break break room or even located in a facility storage room or copy room. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has guidelines that recommend the inclusion of five key steps that you can see on this diagram here. First one is receiving, cleaning, and decontamination, a separate area for that. Separate area for preparation and packaging. Third area for sterilization and a fourth area for monitoring the sterilization process for assurance. And fifth and final is storage. And this is, a, this is a continuous process that you don't want to disrupt this flow because implementing these steps supports a smooth to uh, dirty to clean design for the flow of instruments that helps contain contamination and maximizes the efficiency. Tracy, back to you. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, so we've covered a lot of things in the last 45 minutes or so. Everything from, again, that 
the facility layout, the layout of the exam room, all of the equipment, um, and just how patients flow throughout a facility. So it's kind of like, well, where do where do I start? Where should I begin this this process? So what we'd first say is just seek the expertise from your architects, equipment providers, um, and we can really help conduct an audit to get you started, an audit of your equipment and your workflows. So this is going to, again, just show and really highlight where your bottlenecks may be or where you can really take advantage of some, some efficiency gains. So, so once you have your audit and you kind of have your baseline current situation, you can start to determine you know, which equipment configurations and workflows you want to keep, maybe it was something you want to revise or maybe just something you want to replace completely. And then once you've made those decisions, uh, you can determine which equipment and workflows you want to standardize. So maybe you want to equip, uh, for, you know, you could standardize on equipment that captures the proper BP or um, how it captures your vitals. What are your processes and your workflows uh, to, ca uh, to capture that data? And then standardizing your workflows uh, to get this seamless and, and efficiency throughout that facility. So those are just some recommended tips on where to get started because it can be a, quite a bit overwhelming uh, just to start out. So with that, just want to really thank everyone for uh, dialing in and spending some time with Kurt and I today walking through those design concepts. Uh, we do have some questions that um, have come in from the audience. So I think Kurt and I are just going to walk through those now, but feel free to add more as if any come up or come, come to mind. So the first one I see um, that's come in is just, have you seen an impact to supply management when introducing a new workflow? So it's a great question. We do uh, get asked often about supply management. And there are a couple uh, things that come to mind. First is that dual access that Kurt talked about where you have that on-stage, off-stage um, setup. So if you have you know, everything on-stage, that's where the patient is. You want that to be neat and tidy, uh, not cluttered. And then off-stage can be kind of where you keep your supplies. Maybe that's where you uh, do replenishment um, in that space. So really separating that space uh, would be a nice uh, supply management practice with that dual access. All right. Kurt, do you want to take the next question? I think we got a couple in here. Yeah, we do. Um, have you, how have you seen self room typically implemented? And in this case, it, it, it depends really greatly on the size and scale of the facility. I've seen it, um, very simply, um, Facilitated in the fact that the person will walk in, check in with the check in at the counter, um, and then just be directed to a particular room. Uh, no, no big deal about that if it's a smaller facility. On larger facilities, uh, I've seen it um, done where they've actually segmented the sections of the the medical office building, and they'll use some kind of creative term term to help kind of give them a visual indication that they one of them had a rainforest area and one of them had a deep blue ocean area and one of them had like a I think a desert theme to them the hallway so that would help them you know narrow it down by two thirds of the facility and then they were given a a large um, a physical path to help them identify the room uh, even though they were told or given a number they would get this physical path that would coordinate possibly by a an animal figure for instance in that desert or ocean. Um, that was one I've seen it done that way. Um, on very large facilities, they may actually use um, uh, RTLS systems to facilitate the the patient finding the room and, and the staff being able to monitor the patient to make sure that they found the correct uh, room as they're, they're going through it. But So it really depends on the size and scale of it. But it's been done a number of ways from very simplistic uh, to very elaborate ways. I think we have one more question, and the question goes, truthfully, how important are one-handed layout rooms? Um, there are two benefits to it. There's an efficiency side to it, and there is a patient engagement side to it. 
Um, from an efficiency perspective, if you can standardize room designs, your clinicians always know where to go for what supplies. Having them um, in close proximity to patient care just saves time. Um, some of these rooms and some of these physicians are particularly the specialists rotate from site to site um, uh, on a daily basis. So understanding what type of supplies and equipment are an easy reach and standardized process just makes their job easier as we talked about standardized care. So that, that definitely helps from an efficiency perspective. From a patient perspective, uh, again, that patient engagement perspective, which is becoming increasingly important, is around making sure that you spend less time looking for stuff as the, the physician or care provider goes through their work. Uh, the more they can keep their eyes focused on the patient, whether looking for supplies or accessing supplies or accessing their information system, the better they're going to come out on a patient engagement score. So from that perspective, um, there are those are two major benefits of a, a standardized design. Next question we have is, has there been a study on the, on the anxiety of a patient with self-rooming? and their experience. I do not know of a quantitative study uh, regarding anxiety, um, but there has been a lot of anecdotal uh, papers written around uh, the preference of patients, particularly uh, in the COVID environment, where um, once you convince them they need to go see the physician, and there's been a number of studies uh, uh, looking at 2020 and the decline in and um, uh, patient engagements with their physician, even though they should, the, the fact that they didn't go when they, they, they should have. Um, once you convince them to go, the last thing you want to do is um, provide or place that patient in a waiting room full of uh, other patients who may have contagious diseases. So um, There are benefits that are being noted, and there, I'm sure there will be good, hard studies. Um, we've had customer examples um, of how they've documented it through their experience, where they've eliminated uh, the waiting room and gone to self-rooming. It's a much better experience uh, to be um, allow themselves to come in and go straight to the room. Um, and they're starting to pick up on use of various devices, such as little uh, text, using text to notify the patient that uh, they can come in for the room and they can stay in their car until that point in time. And that's, that's just in a great way. That's actually just providing a secondary benefit because who wants to go to the physician's office and just wait? So at that point there, um, like I said, I, I haven't seen a, a deep study yet, but um, I'm sure that will be coming here as, as time goes on. Tracy, I think there's a question here for you. Could you please provide us with a source of a survey of your exam room utilization rate? Yeah, yep. We actually uh, can send that out as a follow-up link. I believe there is a case study um, that's available on our website uh, with the details of that uh, utilization rate. So you can certainly um, send that out after the call in addition to uh, the brochures and some of that other collateral that you all have received um, by signing up for this webinar. So I can certainly get that out to the group. And I, and I think that study also quotes the best in class is somewhere in the neighborhood, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent, which is interesting in and of itself. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, it's an interesting study, so we'll send that out. Lots of good, good details there. All right. Okay. I don't looks... see any other questions? Do you, Kurt? I do not. I do not. All right, Nikki. Do we hand it back? Yes. Thank you. If you would yes, like to watch you. a Thanks replay, it's okay. If you would like to watch a replay of this webinar, it will be found on the MCD website in the next week at mcd.
D-M-A-G dot com forward slash webinars. We thank you for your participation and have a nice day.